So we're looking at a, a fairly simple but um, very troublesome in terms of uh, understanding these aspects for uh, functional anatomy when you're looking at the body and it's this concept of planes and then movements within those planes. And I think it's an exciting aspect um, and it, it helps us describe human movement and it helps us understand the varieties of exercises, the different types of things that may be available to us. And uh, I think the reason why it's complex is because you are trying to rectify two-dimensional uh, analysis with a three-dimensional body and trying to think within this three-dimensional space. And so that's where it gets a little confusing. But if you enough practice with it, you start to uh, make sense of these planes and, and movements that are happening there. The first thing that needs to happen is you start have to start visually in the body in terms of these segments. And really, this is all you have. You have about seven joints that, that we produce all of the movements that we can possibly think of as a human. Now, there's some freaks out there that can do some really weird things. But for the most part, these are the segments you're dealing with. You're dealing with the, the upper extremity, which has the elbow and the wrist and the shoulder. And then you have the lower extremity, which has the ankle, the complexity of the foot and the hand. That's most of the movements in themselves, the knee, the hip. Then you have the shoulder girdle up here and you have the pelvic girdle here, which is the transition between the, as we'll talk about later, the appendicular skeleton and the axial skeleton. Then you have your spine, which is usually lumped into one segment, but extremely complex. This whole shoulder girdle, spine, pelvic girdle complex is basically the engine that drives all human movement. And it's, I know it's simplified in the schematic here, but it's, it really is quite fascinating. But when you look through the textbooks, you'll start to in be introduced to these terms, trying to understand movement. Th the best thing I can say is start visualizing the body as these segments, what the arm is doing, what the shoulder girdle is doing, what the spine, what this opposite leg is doing. And it makes a biomechanical assessment a little easier. Um, there is a, uh, a learning curve, if you will, when you start dealing with anat functional anatomy and it's almost like learning a foreign language because you are dealing with uh, words that we normally like up, down, front, back, and we're abandoning those for terms like anterior, posterior, superior, inferior. So it helps when you, if you've had some exposure to this before, but it's not complicated to just be overly complicated to make physiologists and exercise specialists and physical therapists look really smart. It's meant to help describe movement so we're all speaking the same language. And these terms aren't as important as this next slide here as making sure that you can represent this and understand what you're seeing. This is where you go from a two-dimensional image to a three-dimensional space, and we're dealing with these with a multi-planar aspect. And we exist in space, and if you want to coordinate movement or describe movement, there's always going to be a three dimensions to that for, the, for our coordinate tracking system. And so when we start looking at the human body, especially when we start looking at movements, we're looking at movements that we're doing in real life in a planar system. In real life, the human body is moving through all three planes. In anatomy, we're describing movement isolated to what the majority of the movement or most of the movement's happening in. So we have these planar systems. You have the sagittal plane, which uh, divides the body into left and right halves. You have the frontal plane, which divides the body into front and back halves. And you have the transverse plane, which divides the body into top and bottom halves. Sometimes you'll hear other terms, depending upon which textbook you're in, like the frontal plane may be referred to as the coronal plane, the transverse plane as the horizontal plane. The sagittal is usually always the sagittal. But just be aware that they're, even though the names might be slightly different, it's all the same thing. What's also represented here, which a lot of students miss, is the axes or the axes that exist here as well. So you have the vertical axis that moves up and down here. And this is the pivot point with all movement within the transverse plane occurs. You have the coronal axis or the frontal axis or the uh, lateral axis, which is all which is provides the movement for all movement within the sagittal plane. And then you have the sagittal axis or the anterior posterior axis, which is the axis that provides all movement for the uh, frontal plane. So this coordinate system isn't locked to the center of mass is what you're seeing here. As I'm going to show on a slide later, this coordinate system can move throughout the, the body. But this is a, a nice schematic. I stole this image from CrossFit and it, it just kind of shows how the, 
sagittal plane, transverse plane, frontal plane divide the body in those halves. The sagittal plane doesn't have to stop, start here, or stop here. It can come here and you can get a sagittal slice through the left leg. You can get a sagittal slice through the shoulder, a sagittal slice through the wrist. Same thing, you can get a transverse um, um, plane slice through the neck, through the torso, through the legs, and so forth. So when it's presented this way, it, it's showing static through the center of mass, but it can exist throughout any aspect of the body. So like I was saying with these axes of rotation, what they're really doing with these planes and these axes are showing how movement is predominantly there. So when you look at the image on the left, you're seeing a uh, segmental movement going forward and back. Here with the frontal plane, you're seeing segmental movement going side to side. And then when you look at the transverse plane, you're looking at segmental moving twisting about, about this vertical axis. But these movements are happening here at the shoulder, can happen at the wrist, at the, at the hip, at the ankle, at the spine. And so it's just how do we classify and categorize these movements? In the end, we're still looking at it from this three-dimensional structure, right? And for an example, uh, when we look at it from an external perspective, when we look at these two images here, when you quickly look at it, you would say that the primary difference is the one, uh, she has a barbell on the left, but arms on the right. But what's really happening is that when she's squatting on the left, she is predominantly favoring the frontal plane because of her wide stance. And on the squat on the right, she's predominantly favoring the sagittal plane. So muscle stimulation wise, it's gonna be very similar, but neurologically and biomechanically, they're gonna be different variations of the same exercise. And so what we're doing is we're having her bias maybe more the, the frontal plane on the left and more the sagittal plane on the right because of the way the way the limbs are going. Same thing when it happens with grip, when you do like a close grip or a wide grip pull down or pressing motion, it's not the grip that matters, it's the width that matters that's forcing you into a particular plane. So we start looking at our interventions, our musculoskeletal interventions, our exercises, we take this three-dimensional coordinate system um, and we analyze quite a bit. What we're trying to do is to get you to take this three, uh, uh, this coordinate system and start applying it to different movements that we see here. And we want to start looking at the body. When we see flesh and skin and clothing, we want to start to see the joints, the bones, and what's happening moving. What we really want to see is we want to start seeing these joints represented at these points in space. So we can start looking at these segments like that first slide I showed you so we can start doing our analysis. And so when I look at people, I see this, right? I see these segments moving, and this is what helps me analyze what's what's going to happen next, or what needs to happen here. What's what's up going up the kinetic chain? What's responsible, and what muscles are on this side of the axis? So this starts with the analysis. And exercise isn't just you go through a, a software, you pick out some exercise and give it to your client or patient. That's horrible intervention. You want to truly be analyzing what's required, what can they do, what do they need to do, and how do you move forward from that. So in each of the planes that you have uh, an axis of rotation, and this can, like I said, can be applied. So here you're looking at the shoulder sagittal axis or the shoulder frontal axis or the shoulder transverse axis. Now, some joints have three axes of rotation. Some joints might only have one or two. If you uh, look through a textbook, you'll be presented with this concept of degrees of freedom. And degrees of freedom really just mean how many axes of rotation, what planes are available to that joint. The elbow can only operate in the sagittal plane, so it has one degree of freedom. The knee can operate in the sagittal plane and the transverse plane, so it has two degrees of freedom. And the hip has three degrees of freedom because it can operate in the sagittal plane, the transverse plane, and the frontal plane. There's no more than three degrees and there's no less than one. So a joint either has one degree of freedom two degrees of freedom, three degrees, and it's really talking about can it operate within any one of those planes. Like I said, this is always presented with the coordinate system being presented through the center of gravity or center of mass, but this coordinate system can be extrapolated out at any of those joints. So at any of these lines here, um, whether it's a uniaxial joint that has one degree of freedom, a biaxial joint that has two, or a triaxial which has three, it can be applied to every joint of the body. Now the next slide's a little complex. This is how you want to view the body with these segmental aspects, right? Here's your upper extremity, elbow, wrist, shoulder, shoulder girdle, spine. And when we start looking at the body from this perspective, it helps simplify our biomechanical analysis. So we can take this three-dimensional uh, three coordinate system and apply it accordingly to 
any joint that we want to analyze. So this whole coordinate system is going to move with it to the shoulder, and we're going to look at frontal plane assessment on the shoulder or uh, uh, sagittal plane assessment on the shoulder. We can look at that at the spine or at the hip, and we can look at what's going on at the hip. In this case with the knee, we only have two degrees of freedom, but we still apply the 3D coordinate system. Remember, just because a joint only has one degree of freedom or moves through one plane, it still is integrated in three-dimensional space. We're still in real life, and we need to analyze accordingly. So hopefully this kind of shows you that this coordinate system can move along with the body and allows us to analyze. And what the coordinate system is really telling us is... Does it have an axis of rotation for the sagittal plane like in this aspect? So we have a frontal axis or an anterior posterior axis. I'm sorry, frontal axis or a, a medial lateral axis that allows movement in the sagittal plane. We have the sagittal axis that allows movement in the frontal plane or the vertical axis in that transverse plane. So it's just a way for us to, to categorize and look at movement. And remember, in reality, the joint, even if I'm doing shoulder flexion, lifting my arm up straight ahead to point at the screen, even though it's predominantly in the sagittal plane, I still need frontal plane and transverse plane motion in order for that to happen. All joint motion is rotational motion. So as I shared in the previous lecture, we have an axis of rotation and we're rotating about that. It doesn't do a full 360 degrees, but we have this like hinge type aspect where you have a single axis of rotation and you have bones that are moving about, rotating about that fixed axis. And so when you start looking at all the available ranges of motion that exist, we start looking at it as from this, how do I insert this pin, this single axis, and what plane did I pin that through? So I put this point so this rotation can occur. So I, if I pin the shoulder from this vantage point, which is I'm looking, I'm looking from the side, so what I'm seeing here is the sagittal plane, I'm looking at the arm moving forward or back or the leg moving forward or back or the neck moving forward or back. And I can do this for every plane that exists, the three that exists. So here we're looking at transverse plane, looking from top down. And from here we're looking from four, uh, straight ahead, right? So we get these these planar movements based on those that 3D coordinate system on those axis of rotation. Joint movements are named for their plane. So from the anatomical position, that reference position that you read in your very first, any functional anatomy book you have, it's always going to talk about this reference position. And it's talking about this anatomical position that we use as a reference point. That's how we start. That's how we move. And if and that is the serves the foundation for our communication. But from anatomical, all motion that occurs in the sagittal plane will have a certain not name. Every movement that occurs in the frontal plane will have a certain name, and every movement that occurs in the transverse plane will have a particular name. So when we look at the sagittal plane, the movement that's happening here when that limb's moving forward and back through that axis of rotation, that coronal axis, uh, when the joint, the bones are getting closer together, that is called flexion. And when the bones or segments are getting further from each other, that's called extension. You'll find a lot in textbooks use this term hyperextension, and it's a it really is an inappropriate term. Hyperextension is typically due to injury. So what they'll say is like from flex to zero neutral is uh, extension, and then from zero to like their super secret extension is hyperextension. I would not get in the habit of using that term. Hopefully that that terminology dies out with the the generation that continues to use it, which is like 10 or 20, 30, maybe 40 years old now, 40 years in the industry, but shoulder flexion, shoulder extension. If you hyperextend something, that purely means that you tore some injury, you injured it and tore some tissues to get beyond its normal physiological range. That's just a tangent. I apologize. Um, so you'll see up in the upper right-hand corner here that I have um, the appendicular skeleton mentioned. And so if you recall, when we look at... Um, uh, the human body or the bones of the skeletal system, we have the appendicular skeleton and we have the axial skeleton. And, and when we look at the appendicular skeleton, the appendicular skeleton is basically the appendages. That's where appendicular comes from. So that includes the arms, the legs, and then the shoulder girdles and the pelvic girdle that, that connect to the core or the axial skeleton. The axial skeleton you see on the right is the core. It's the spine and the skull, the sacrum. And outside of the ribs, it's typically the bones that you have one of. So you have a pair of scapula, a pair of humeri, a pair of radius, a pair of... When you look at the a vertebral column, you have one skull, you have one sacrum, and you have one sternum, and you have the spinal column. 
what throws off this comparison are the ribs, but the ribs are really, they are just an extension of the thoracic spine. So you have a pair of ribs that are tied to one thoracic vertebra. So the, the clavicles are part of the shoulder girdle. The ribs are part of the, um, the axial skeleton, appendicular skeleton. So movements that happen in the appendicular skeleton in the sagittal plane, um, are in the planes are going to be described differently than they do in the other planes. Fortunately for us, the sagittal plane motions um, for axial skeleton and appendicular skeleton are the same. So the term flexion and extension are used both for appendicular skeleton and the axial skeleton. But this is it. For the other two planes, there's different terminology. So you can see here uh, in the appendicular skeleton, shoulder flexion, hip flexion, elbow and so forth, all flexion and extension, regardless as if it's the um, appendicular skeleton, so the arms or legs, or the axial skeleton, the cervical spine, thoracic spine, or lumbar spine. When we move into the frontal plane and the transverse plane, we will have different movements. Now still staying in the sagittal plane, we have some special uh, terminology. Um, remember the definition of flexion is two joints getting closer together. And when we look at the uh, ankle here, right there, and we're looking at this ankle uh, flexion versus ankle extension, it's hard to determine which one is moving closer, which one is moving further away. So instead of trying to figure out which is extension, which is flexion, the special terminology is when we look at the foot, you have a dorsal surface of the foot, which is the top of the foot, and you have a plantar surface of the foot, which is the bottom of the foot. So if the plantar surface is moving closer, so you pushing down on the gas pedal, that's called plantar flexion. And if the dorsal surface is moving closer, that is called dorsiflexion. So that's just a special consideration within the sagittal plane. When we move to the frontal plane, um, movement in this plane is referred to as abduction or abduction. And when you abduct something, you take something away. So you're moving away from midline and you have adduction. When you add something, you're adding towards, this is from, is adding towards midline. So your midline is right here. And remember, this is from anatomical position as the reference position. Starting from here, if his arm comes up, he is moving away from midline, even though if he had his arm started here and he's moving up over his head, that is still abduction because it's, you're, you're looking back at the reference position. In the axial skeleton, you can't move away from midline or towards midline because the midline is the spine and it's moving. So we talk about lateral flexion to the right or lateral flexion to the left. And this can happen at the cervical spine, this can happen at the thoracic spine, and this can happen at the lumbar spine. So you do not ab or adduct in the torso, you laterally flex in the torso. You ab and abduct your arms or your legs. So this is a hip abduction, this is hip adduction. We have uh, two special considerations. One image I have here, which is the ankle movement, a foot movement. You have eversion and inversion. So eversion of the foot, the bottom of the foot, the plantar surface is facing away from midline. So both of these images are right legs. And then this one, you have inversion where the, inside, the bottom of your foot is facing in. Wrist ab and abduction, which if you look at your hand, you have a ulnar side, which is your pinky side, and you have a radial side, which is your thumb side. And if the ulnar side is moving towards midline or moving towards the hand or the rest of the arm, that is ulnar deviation. And if the uh, thumb side is moving towards the forearm, so out to the side, that's called radial deviation. When we move to the transverse plane, uh, we have internal and external rotation, sometimes referred to as medial and lateral rotation. So the external rotation would be turning out towards midline. Um, and I bet you would guess that that would also mean lateral rotation because lateral also means a way out from midline. And then you have internal rotation, uh, which is ro which is the segment turning in towards midline, which I guess you would, you, hopefully you would guess that's also the same as medial rotation because that's the definition of medial, which is towards midline. The midline is moving in the axial skeleton, so it's you do not internally or externally rotate through the spine. You, as the same thing with the lateral flexion, left or right, you're either turning your head to your left or turning your head to your right. You're turning your trunk to the left or you're turning your trunk to the right. So in this case, what you're seeing here, uh, she is producing left trunk rotation, and that's a combination of lumbar, thoracic, and probably some spinal movement. 
And in the next image, I show this cervical rotation turning to the left, right, left, right. Here um, in the previous slide, we looked at the leg moving in or out uh, for internal external rotation. And here we're looking at the hand or arm turning in or out. The problem in this position, normally you'll see internal external rotation depicted at 90 degrees of flexion because that surely, truly shows the shoulder motion. Here, if I turn my hand in or out, that could also be coming from the wrist in terms of wrist external internal rotation. And we give that special consideration as well. So you've probably heard of these terms. Uh, this is a right arm, and you can see the hand like a knife karate chop. That's a neutral position. And if I present my palm up, that is supination. And if I present my palm down, that's pronation. So supination, pronation. And if you have a bowl of soup, you want to keep that upright. And if you want to pour it out pronation, you would push your hands down. Another uh, movement that happens, special consideration within the transverse plane, is this horizontal abduction and horizontal adduction. Although they say they share the same terms with um, hor uh, with frontal plane ab and abduction, they are nothing like ab and adduction. It actually creates a lot of confusion, even for experts and specialists in the field. Horizontal abduction and adduction are more similar to sagittal plane flexion and extension. And in fact, this really is just flexion and extension. It's just happening in the transverse plane instead of the um, sagittal plane. So horizontal AB or abduction, when you abduct, you're moving away from midline. So that would be opening your hands. This is what you see in the image on the left, like you're going to give someone a hug. And horizontal adduction are the arms coming together towards the front, um, like you're going to smack a, a, a fly try to, or give someone a hug. So as I said, the horizontal abduction here is more biomechanically and physiologically related to shoulder extension, which is shoulder pla uh, sagittal plane motion. And this here is actual more like shoulder flexion, which is horizontal. A a and you can do this both at the shoulder and at the hip. So on Blackboard, I have these images here, and it would be good practice for you to start to be able to familiarize yourself with these uh, m movements, but more importantly, to be able to identify what plane of motion they're occurring in, and even most important, where the axis of rotation is occurring, so that you can actually start to put together that three-dimensional coordinate system. I have this image here that kind of shows some of the special motions. Um, the planes and some of the exercises that are tied into that. But there are quite a bit of resources online for you to look. Um, this is an area of contention that a lot of students have trouble with at the beginning, and I think not because it's a complex topic, because you're trying to think three-dimensionally, you're trying to think abstractly, and you're starting to use new language. So it's like a foreign language, science class, and art class all in one, which can make it difficult. But trust me, if you wrap your brain around it enough, it becomes just like art or a foreign language uh, or math becomes um, second nature.